as I said, the world's top executive coach. Please do welcome him on stage. to be with all of you for a short time. <laughs> and uh, I want to congratulate all of you as successful senior executives, uh, the great work that you're doing in this industry to transform not only your industry but the world, to make it a positive, more productive world. So I congratulate all of you from the depths of my soul for the great leadership that you're bringing to the world. And you all know, in the roles that you're in, we have a significant need in the world for great leadership. We do have a massive gap. I'm sure you've noticed in the work that you do that we do have a massive gap in terms of leadership. We have no shortage of intellect in the world. I, I know that you're struck as you talk to uh, your peers and your associates with the high IQ that exists in the world. I often leave CEO meetings and executive meetings all over the world. And I'm astonished when I leave those meetings, I hop on an airplane and I say, the raw intellect is astonishing. But we do have a massive gap in terms of leadership. And ultimately, what I've been able to learn along my journey is that the heart and the soul, think about you as successful senior leaders leaving here in a couple of days, absolutely committed to becoming better and doing more, not only in your work, but your home life, in your communities, in our nations. We have a massive gap in leadership, primarily because leaders are uncomfortable going deep into their soul and having the courage to pull out their heart and show it authentically to people so that we show more care and more concern and compassion. And we got to commit to become better communicators and collaborators. Certainly coming out of the pandemic, and I'm sure all of you have noticed this, the need for doing those important elements of heart and soul has never been more important for all of us. When you look at Generation Z, the younger people and the massive young talent that exists in the world, it is your responsibility, it is all of our responsibility to cultivate the strong leadership that we see in the young people. Am I correct, everybody? Am I correct? Think of the young people in your organizations, the incredible talent. It's your responsibility to work with those individuals to accelerate their development. I want to share with all of you that I'm very humbled to work with some of the top CEOs and government leaders in the world. I pinch myself. I really do. I, I often can't believe all this incredible stuff that's happening to me and my businesses. I pinch myself. But I want to share a little story with you. It was 2010. It was about a year before Steve Jobs passed. It's very interesting. In Cupertino, California, there's a bookstore that he frequented. And in this bookstore was a book that I had written in 1996 that was a failure. I raised my hand and share with all of you that the book sold very, very few copies. Well, incredibly, Steve Jobs picked up my book in 2010. He was doing a lot of reading, a lot of soul searching, because he was dying from pancreatic cancer. Tragic, 
and a very, very tough cancer. What a courageous soul that I met. What a privileged opportunity I had in 2010, before my CEO coaching career even took off. I worked with Steve Jobs for five sessions. And let me share with you what he shared with me in our second session. He said, John, I gotta tell you, I'm very, very proud of what I've been able to accomplish in my life. Very proud. But I need to share something with you, and I said, please do. He said, John, I could have been a better. Think about this one, everybody. This hopefully gives goosebumps to all of you. He said, John, I'm proud. But I really honestly could have been a better leader. I also could have been a better father. And I could have been a better husband. I have goosebumps right now. I experienced those words directly in his heart, in his soul. He then shared with me, he said, listen, I don't know anything about coaching, but I want to share with you that if I had actually committed to doing this work that we actually did over five sessions in my 30s and 40s, I, in fact, truly believe that I would have been a better leader, a better person, a better father, and a better husband. I can't tell you how many CEOs call me who are unbelievably successful, just like all of you. And I ask them, why do you want to work with me? You're in, you're in your mid six. I didn't work with CEOs in the early 70s, everybody. You talk about goosebumps. And here's what they say to me. They say to me, listen, I'm pretty proud of what I've been able to accomplish, but I truly know in the depths of my soul, I am not the best that I can be. And that's part of my message for all of you here today. Be proud of your individual and collective successes. You are changing the world. You're disrupting this industry. This industry is transforming quickly, as you all know. Be proud of all of your successes. But I want you to leave here in two days and commit to polishing your personal masterpieces because we've all been put on this earth to create a masterpiece, not only individually, but collectively. Think of your organizations out there. You come together to create a masterpiece that changes the world. Very, very few people think like that. Most people were so busy, were pulled in so many different directions. I think it's important to take some time out, pat yourself on the back, be proud of your accomplishments, be proud of what you're doing in your home lives as you develop your families. But in the end, we've got to commit to polishing and finishing the masterpiece that we were all put on the earth to create, all of us, all of us. So there's always gaps. I don't care who you are. There's always room to get better. Steve Jobs recognized that too late in his life. Too late, 55 years old. That's only part of the story. Let me share with you the other part of the story. I grew up in the United States, my family originally from Italy. My family left Italy in the late 1800s, landed in New York. I grew up outside the Boston area, and I met somebody at 15 years old, now my wife, actually. I met my wife, Gail, at 15 years old in history class. Here we are, 44 years later, married, four amazing 
adult children, age 30 to 40, five grandchildren, two more on the way. Just like all of you, I'm proud of my family, and I know you are too. A lot of creating the masterpiece is about leaving a legacy, isn't it? How important it is that we put the finishing touches on our individual masterpieces, but our organizational masterpieces, because ultimately a masterpiece you share with others long after you're gone from the world. Think about that. Think about that. We are put on the earth to create a legacy that enriches the souls and the hearts of other people. That is our personal responsibility to our families, to our employees. And when you hear me speaking right now, you might be sitting here saying, this is a little bit different, maybe than what you expected. I might shock you on this one. Steve Jobs was incredibly bright. That's not a shock. His IQ was 180. Okay, 180, 99.9th percentile in the database. A brilliant creative genius. I also will tell you that he did have a heart. Despite the movies that maybe all of you have seen, where it was portrayed he was tough, and he was really, really direct, and he was. He was really, really tough. But he did have a heart. You know what his problem was? It's a problem that many of you see. He was afraid to dig deep into his soul. He was afraid to go in here, pull it out, share it authentically with people. That was his gap. But when you saw him speak, just go watch the old films of Steve Jobs on a platform. He was an amazing speaker. You know why he was an amazing speaker? He never spoke from here. He spoke from where? His heart. He showed his heart selectively. And as I look at your leadership, leadership that you're bringing in your organizations, I just want you to think about it. I want you to challenge yourself to raise the bar, not only on your intellect, but your heart and your soul. Because ultimately, that's what we call intelligent leadership, which actually I'm known for, as I've written a bunch of books on the concept of intelligent leadership, by the way, the book that failed miserably that I authored in 1997 was called Success Yourself. Massive failure. I later rewrote the book in 2013 into a global bestseller. Timing is important, wouldn't you agree? Timing's important. So anyway, 44 years married to my wonderful, beautiful wife, who's the pillar of our family, the matriarch. I go to graduate school, leave graduate school, I get a degree in industrial psychology, take my first job at Conoco. I get exposed to this concept of a mentor. We all know who a mentor is, right? Mentors. I meet a gentleman by the name of Lou Larson. I'm like 26, 27 years old. Lou's 66, 67, I'm 66 right now. And I'll never forget this. Lou Larson looked at me, he said, John, listen, we, we have an opening in our department, it was the training department, Conoco. He said, John, I, I, I believe in you. You know what's interesting about mentors? Isn't it true mentors often believe in you more than you believe in yourself?
yourself, isn't that true? Isn't that beautiful? We need that. Especially when we're young, but also when we're old, too. We always need mentors. And he said, John, I'm going to give you an opportunity to join our company. And I'm going to have you do training programs teaching leadership. I looked at him, I said, whoa, leadership? I'm 26 years old. I don't know anything about leadership. He said, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you. And he taught me. And then he gave me an opportunity to actually run classes at Conoco. So I did that for about four years, and I'm getting feedback from executives at Conoco and the senior executive team. I'm only 28, 29 years old, everybody. They said, John, you're a great speaker. I said, I am? They said, yeah, you could probably go out and make a lot of money doing this stuff. True story. So I ran home to my wife, Gail, and I said, you won't believe what I'm going to do. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to leave my job. We got two kids at home at the time. I said, I'm going to run around the world and speak. She said, you're insane. There's no way that you're going to do that. I want to share with all of you, I did it. I took a risk. I went against my wife. I'll never do it again. <laughs> 10 years, age 30 to 40, I travel the world. What am I doing? I'm speaking. So, you know, I, I'd go to do a speech wherever in the world, and the audience would like it. Sometimes they stand up, I get on the plane, and I say, boy, am I good. I'm incredible. Age 30 to 40. Six years in, my wife and I look at the bank account. There's nothing in it. She said, what are you, what are you doing? You, you're not supporting the family. And you're running around the world selfishly. I said, I, I, I agree. It was difficult for me to give it up. I did a speech in New York City, 38 years old. I figured this was the last speech I was ever going to deliver. In the front row, there's a publishing company called Master Media. They approached me at the end of the speech. We said, we've got a contract for you. We're gonna, you can write a book for us. I remember calling my wife, Gail, and I said, you won't believe what happened. We're going to be rich, OK? But I got a book deal, right? Let me tell you what. The book, I think maybe two copies sold, sincerely. The book, the book never sold. Long story short, um, it was such a failure. I went back in the corporate world, everybody, 40 to 55. It was the greatest thing I ever did. I grew tremendously as a person in those 15 years, as a leader. I want to share with all of you, at 55 years old, a year after I had the incredible opportunity to meet Steve Jobs. I had not even made the decision to actually roll this into now the four companies, humbly, that I've been able to build with my people. I never, ever envisioned humbly what's happened. I'm running around the lake doing my exercise regimen in Orlando, Florida. And I'm never going to forget what happened. As I ran around the lake, I literally stopped in my tracks. And I heard the words. And the words were, you must go back and do what you were put on the earth to do. And then I felt distinctly a pull, an energy. And I was overwhelmed. It was called a calling. It's a calling. And I know some of you have experienced before, there's an energy, there's an aura. Call my wife again. I said, you won't believe what happened. 
I said, I'm going to do it again. She said, what are you going to do again? I said, I'm going to start my business again at 55 years old. She looked at me. She said, you, you, you can do this. You have my blessing. But do not mess it up this time. True story. I thought back on that particular day and I reflected on why all of this happened. I do believe, by the way, the opportunity to meet Steve Jobs was an instigator to the call. It was certainly a contributor. But I thought back on my life journey and I've learned a lot about what I believe leadership is and what it isn't. And maybe this will resonate with some of you, maybe all of you. It was very, very clear that I had lived my life, 55 years. I was a pretty good father. Interesting, right? Back to what Steve Jobs said, also, at 55, okay? I was a pretty good father, actually. Consider myself a pretty good husband, 44 years. And I was a pretty good professional but I was not the best that I could be. I was not optimized. I was not polished. And, it, and then I realized why. Because I had actually deluded myself into believing that my life's journey was, in fact, about me. And boom, it hit me in the head. I now realize, and this is the message I want to share with all of you today, and I know all of you know this. The question is, though, are you going to leave here and embrace it in the depths of your soul? Because ultimately, you're the only person who can do it. I personally made the decision 15 years ago that I was no longer going to live my life selfishly, that I was going to do this work that I'm called to do. It is a great privilege for me to be here with all of you here today. Success is what I'm looking at here. Successful people, successful organizations. It's privilege. I believe that we must all hold ourselves to a higher level and really realize that each and every one of us are put on the earth to touch the hearts and the minds and souls of others in a positive way. That's what leadership is. Hearts, hearts. Mind, soul. And maybe you've seen it. We got a lot of this, but we're short on heart and soul. It takes courage, not weakness, to build an environment in your families and your businesses, where you show care to others authentically. Everybody with me on this. Where you show concern to others authentically. Where you show compassion. And you raise the bar on how effectively you communicate with others so that you build a bond with others. Right? A bond. Right? Connection. Deep connection. You know, you meet people and they say, boy, I got a lot of friends and I got a lot of great relationships. Then why do relationships deteriorate so quickly? Have you noticed that? I'm talking about this. Creating bonds with your people and your family members in your community, nations coming together where you can't break the bond. Mindset. Mindset drives emotions. Emotions drives behavior. Behavior drives results. It's an algorithm. I'm going to share a name with you. Some of you know the name. Some of you may not know the name. Out of this industry, 2014, William J. Logue, CEO of FedEx Freight, 
legendary CEO, one of the greatest CEOs I've ever known, still a very good friend of mine, and one of the great leaders in the world, and certainly this industry. Bill Lowe, in 2014, at the end of 2014, announces that he's retiring literally at the peak of his career. You know why? Here's why. Because he had actually created a beautiful masterpiece heading up FedEx Freight. But he had not created the masterpiece in his personal life. He was worried about his health. He was worried about his kids. And he was worried about his grandkids. Bill Logue made a commitment that he was going to polish his heart, mind, and soul in areas where he did not actually do it. That took courage. Bill Logue. As you think about what you can do to raise your bar, to bring a higher level of leadership, I do want you to think about the masterpiece. But I also want you to think about the levers that will enable you to achieve what it is that you're all called to do, which is, number one, I encourage all of you, the great leaders that you are in this room, to work with your people in your organizations to continue to get them to think differently and to think big and to be disruptive in a positive way, to be transformative. That's what Steve Jobs was all about. Remember the Think Different speech years ago? The concept of pushing the envelope is what is absolutely essential if all of us are going to be successful navigating the world that we live in today. Think differently and think big. It's not about the person or organization that you want to create. That's too simple. I want to challenge you to ask yourself a much bigger, deeper question. It's not about what you want to create. It's about what you must create. Because we do have a responsibility, and we have an accountability to our stakeholders, and our family, and our friends, and our employees. Think differently, think big. Number two, I encourage all of you to look at the decision to be vulnerable as the most important decision that we can make as a human being. We teach vulnerability to our children all over the world. Parents in this room, show your hands. I see a number of hands going up. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. I've been to 53 countries. I'm amazed as I look at different, different parts of the world and different religion. It doesn't matter where we are in the world. Parents want good things for their kids. We teach our kids to be vulnerable. You know why we teach our kids to be vulnerable? Because we recognize that they're vulnerable. That's the instigator to learning and growing. In interesting, isn't it? And then all of a sudden we get in the business world and all of a sudden vulnerability shuts down. I want you to challenge yourself to look at raising your hand courageously and saying, hey, guess what? I realize I'm pretty good. But I'm not the best that I can be. I encourage you to give me feedback on what I need to do differently and better to become the best that I can be. That takes courage. The vulnerability decision is the most important decision that we can make. It is a driver to learning. It is also, for the senior executives in the room, you all know this, it's also the instigator to innovation, right? And who does not want an innovative culture. It will never happen if you've got a senior executive team that is not consciously embracing the decision to be vulnerable. Number three, I encourage you when you leave here today 
to be very proud of the gifts and the strengths that you bring to the world. Every human being is on the earth because they have gifts and strengths. Every human being. I want you to work with yourself and your team and isolate the gifts and strengths that people bring to the world and work with them authentically to polish those gifts and strengths and commit to making those strengths even stronger tomorrow than they are today, simultaneously addressing those development needs. Number four, the ability to create a plan, just like your business is a strategy. Right? You need a strategy to support your vision. Every human being in this room, all of us, we need a strategy to leverage our gifts and strengths, simultaneously addressing those gaps. Number five, execute that plan with passion, pride, and precision. Go after it every single day. Create an environment and culture where people believe in the depths of their soul, they can execute for you. They will execute and they must execute. Number six, to be vigilant, to keep your eyes open, to be aware of your impact on others so that you ultimately can course correct and be agile. And finally, privilege. Look at every human, every human interaction in the world. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to wake up every single day. It's a privilege to have others enrich our hearts, our minds, and our souls. It's a privilege to do the same for others. Are you giving goosebumps to people? That's another definition of intelligent leadership. We don't give enough goosebumps in the world. When you leave here, I want you to think about what your goosebump meter is. Are you giving chills to people? Are you absolutely touching them deeply with every single interaction? We're falling short. By and large. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been my privilege to have this opportunity. Short, but I hope, I really, really hope that the message is hit a chord. I want to share with all of you that even in our short time, you have touched, just through your eyeballs looking at You've touched my heart, you've touched my mind, and you've touched my soul. And I hope I've done the same for you. Thank you all so much.